Well, hello, Mavericks. I hope you're really mad because that's what we're going to talk about here. Revenge trading. Now, revenge trading, it's, it's kind of a funny thing. We all joke about it. We all think it's ridiculous. And we all say, oh my gosh, that's such a silly behavior. Yet, every single one of us has engaged in it. We all have. We all have engaged upon it at one point in our careers. So, let's jump into why it happens. Let's go through this emotional cycle again of a negative trade. Before the trade, you're making all the, all the right decisions. You're using your prefrontal cortex. It's all logic and reason. You get into the trade, all of a sudden, adrenaline kicks in, cortisol kicks in. And then if you make a trade, then dopamine, or make a positive trade, dopamine kicks in. If you don't make a, a positive trade and the trade's a loss, all of a sudden, you get all these emotional responses out of it. And all of a sudden, the brain is going to program of, okay, this is what we're going to do next time this happens. Here's the problem. It's not symmetric across the board. So I highly recommend studying loss aversion theory. So uh, first of all, for anyone that is wondering, theory doesn't mean something that an idea something has. In the world of science, a theory is a fact. So this is fact. This is actually fact. It's not a hypothesis. It's a theory. It's a fact. They've done lots and lots of studies around this. And they've shown that the pain of loss is nearly twice as powerful as the pleasure of gain. All right. That's really powerful. So losses are going to affect you more than gains. 100%. That's going to happen. Now, one of the studies they do to show this is that they give somebody ten dollars and they say okay you can bet this um, you can bet this and you have a 50 50 chance to either lose that ten dollars or win ten dollars now if they take that ten dollars out of their own pocket and they bet it they are much more risk adverse than if they found literally a, a minute before found ten dollars on the ground now look that $10 is their money, regardless of how they got it, whether they found it on the ground or whether they went to work for it. But when they get to that bet, the pain of losing $10 that they worked for, because again, they attach it to, oh, I had to work 30 minutes at my crappy job I didn't like. Um, all of a sudden that becomes painful because they owned it. They had ownership of it. They, they earned it. And again, this is called the endowment effect. The endowment effect is, hey, I own this. Things that people believe that they own, that they've put time and effort and resources into, is very, very sacred to them. So loss aversion therapy says, or theory says that, again, loss is huge. The endowment effect of how much ownership you feel of it, it's going to hurt more when you take a loss. And people are much more willing uh, to take risk then avoid a loss so a again this is all about how we're built as humans and then the last one the sunk cost fallacy this is the one I really wanted to get into because this is really what revenge trading is all about it's about the sunk cost fallacy so let's take a look at exactly what revenge trading is it's basically saying I'm mad about my last trade and I'm going to carry that into my next trade. Now, the way that revenge trading works is a lot of the time, it's basically I was long, I lost money long, I'm going to go short. Or I was short on the last trade, and now I'm going to go long. And a lot of times, it's on the exact same symbol. Now, look, I've done this before. Um, I was trading a news event early on in my career, and I thought the, the movement was going to be up. I thought it was going to be bullish, so I took a bullish trade, and all of a sudden, the news comes out, and it moves against me, and it's red, and it's red, and it's red, and I'm looking at it saying, oh my gosh, I'm such an idiot. I'm going to, like, I just lost $500, and so what I do, I literally sell my long position and go short, because I just need that $500 back, because right now, it's, it's really tanking to the, to the downside, and I need that $500 back. Well, it reverses, goes right back up to where it was before the news announcement, and I now have lost $500 twice. 
I simply wanted the money back and I was wrong on one side so I had to get it back on the other side. Recency bias. Again, the same symbol. If you are trading Tesla and you lost a thousand dollars on Tesla, by goodness, you are going to get it back from Tesla. You are laser focused on that symbol because that's where you lost it. And if you get it back from that symbol, the loss never happened. Now look, once a trade is done, it's done. And this is where I always challenge people when they, when they bring up things like this. And, I'm, and I say, look, so you're telling me, so they just took a loss in Tesla. So you're telling me you look through the entire markets. You look through all the possible symbols you could trade. And you started at the beginning from a top-down approach. You went through all the thing. And literally after that entire process, you came up with Tesla was the best one. That's amazing. Do you know how absolutely amazing that was? Look, it wasn't amazing because it wasn't real. This person is revenge trading. So the recency bias, it's either, again, I was long, I need to be short, I had the direction wrong, I need to go the other direction, or this is the symbol that took it, or people even go into the sector. Well, okay, Tesla lost my money, but I'm going to go now short um, Lucid Motors because they do electric vehicles too. That's the same thing. That's, that's the same thing. You're just simply doing the same thing. The point is, you need to understand that there's baggage. Baggage is bad. So again, key concept here. Until you're self-aware, you are a computer program running what your brain has already predetermined. If you don't understand what's happening, you're just going to run programs. You're going to run programs and you're never going to be self-aware. You're never going to be autonomous. You're just a robot. So we have to understand these things happen. We have to understand that our personality is going to cause some of us to struggle more with other things. Like again, I struggled with overtrading. There's a lot of people I've met that said, oh, I've never struggled with that. Well, <laughs> congratulations. I'm really jealous of you because it wasn't a fun one. But guess what? They're also fairly risk adverse probably. Well, I've never had to struggle with that. Like I've always, I've always been very confident in uh, making my financial decisions to my detriment sometimes. But as you can see here, it's self-awareness. What, what are your issues? What are your triggers? So let's talk about the sunk cost fallacy because this is where, this is the crux of why people revenge trade. Is because they believe that they already have sunk costs. Now let's go back to the movie, The Money Pit. Or some of you have actually owned a money pit uh, called a house. You know, it's basically the, the concept. If you haven't seen the movie, um, a young couple decides they're going to, they want to buy this really, really uh, old house in this really desirable neighborhood, but it is really broken down. And so they get in and they find out that they're constantly putting money into a bottomless pit in repairs and expenses. And at some point they put in so much money that they literally can't walk away from it. They, they psychologically, they're, they're invested. They can't walk away from it. That is the sunk cost fallacy. Now they should walk away from it. I mean, imagine they could walk away from it, stop putting money into it and start saving up money and go buy a different house. Now that would be the smart thing to do. But the problem is the sunk cost fallacy is going to make that very, very difficult. Very difficult. In trading, it's the same thing. You're going to have time. The last trade you made, you had time in it. You put in effort, you put in money. And the more of that you put in, the more it is you're going to want to stick with that trade or get that money back. In one of our um, summits we did years ago, it was in Chicago, I can't remember what year, maybe 2013, um, I remember this topic came up and I had actually just made this point before to one of the guys in the office because they were a big football fan. Um, they were a local university football fan. And I knew their friend was a, a diehard fan of that team. 
and they were like upset because they they lost the game. I said, "Ah, you don't really care, but but uh, he cares. Mike Mike really cares. You don't." And they're like, "How could you say that?" And I said, "Because I know Mike had gone out to the spring practices. He researches the team. He knows who they're recruiting. He he goes deep into this. And I know you. You don't do it all that deep." And so I know that it's more meaningful to him than it is to you just because of the time effort he's put into it. And he said, yeah, you're right. So literally a week later, we were at our trading summit and this came up and I talked about how there is a point where doing too much research is negative because of the sunk fallacy, the sunk cost fallacy. If someone has spent three to four hours reading about a company, listening to the earnings conference calls, reading transcripts, going through message boards, they have invested time, effort, and money into that position. It's going to be much more difficult for them to walk away from that. And if, let's say, they make that trade, they put in hours and hours of work and take a loss, the impetus to get that money back is going to be stronger. But let's take, let's take the other side of that trade. Let's say that uh, you sat down at your computer, did no research, did no effort, you did nothing, you picked a stock, you flipped a coin, went long or short, and you made the trade. And you took a loss. Would you want to go back in and trade that exact same symbol? No. <laughs> you, you, there were, it would, there would be no reason to. It, it, there's no, you have no time. You have no effort tied up in that trade. You, you didn't do any of it. So all of a sudden, it's so easy to walk away from it and just go on to the next trade. So this is the reason why people revenge trade, is that it's the sunk fallacy that they've put time, they've put effort, and they've put money into this, and it took it. And they need to get it back to justify all that time, money, and effort. Again, baggage. So let's talk about how to avoid this revenge trading. All right. Uh, the first one I talked about, I do believe that there is a penalty for doing too much research. And I cannot stand it when our traders say, Rob, I know Microsoft. And I know, I've watched Microsoft for five years and I used to work there. I know Microsoft. And I just say, what are you talking about? Like you're saying you know that Microsoft's gonna go from 110 to 112 because you've worked there in the past? Like it's gonna go there in the next three days because you've watched it for five years? No, it's, you've, you've sunk in so much time and effort into that one symbol that you literally are, are sucked into it. So there is such a thing as doing too much research. And, and I don't know where that line is. I don't know where that line is for you, but it's something to be aware of. And just understand that the more research you put into something, the more likely you are to engage in holding it for too long or revenge trading. So the best thing you can do is eliminate a watch list. So what I mean by that is that a lot of people keep a watch list. They keep, okay, I've got 20 stocks on my watch list and I'm watching these all the time and I'm seeing what they're doing all the time. Do you see how that's going to lead you to overtrade those symbols? So I highly recommend everyone throw away a watch list, make a weekly watch list and say you start the week off saying, okay, well, I'm looking at these, these positions. I'm looking at these currencies. I'm looking at these symbols for stocks and I'm going to ignore the rest. And then you just, you literally have that list of 10 or 20 or 30, whatever it is you're looking at. And then at the end of the week, throw them away. Throw them away. Eliminate that watch list. Another thing you can do, uh, if you just took a loss on something, take the symbol off your software. If you can't see it, you can't trade it. Eliminate it. Eliminate that symbol. Just take it off and then you can put it back on next week. Start at the beginning. This is where, again, Revenge trading is you're reacting to what happened in the last trade. So you're bringing that baggage in. 
So this is where it's very healthy to start at the beginning. And I know traders that will shut their systems down. They'll literally turn their computers off, get up, go for a walk. When they come back, they have to sit down, turn the computer back on, boot everything up, load up all their programs. I know it's just semantics, but that does something in your brain to where it says, okay, this is done. I talked about in one of my prior videos about a trader that would crumple up their setup sheet and burn it. Very dramatic, but the effect was, hey, this trade's over. It's, it's over. It's not, it doesn't even exist anymore. So whatever you can do to get rid of that, it's important. And again, it's just making rules. Now, it's making rules that you not only will keep, or sorry, that you are going to keep, but can keep. You know, if, if I love, um, let's say I love donuts, and I decide that I'm going to go on a, do a diet and never have a donut again my entire life, I will fail at that diet 100% of the time. It's not about discipline. I'm a disciplined person, but I, I'll need a donut somewhere in my life for sure, for sure. Um, I'm setting myself up for failure. So whenever you think about rules, okay, what rules can you actually do? And again, I think something just as simple as turning off your system and not just exiting out, but literally powering down your entire system, getting up out of your chair, walking around. It just psychologically does something to when you come back, the baggage is gone. Put yourself in a trading halt. I put myself in trading halts all the time for good and bad reasons. Um, and it's because I want to I want to sever the emotions that I'm feeling at the moment and I want to go away and then when I come back I'm starting at the beginning it's very very important to understand that so when you talk about revenge I love this saying here in revenge the best revenge is massive success so I know in the moment, in the heat of the moment, your blood is up, your adrenaline's up, your anger is up. But you know that it's not going to lead to success if you trade like this. The best way to get success is to back off, take a break, follow your rules, and come back stronger and better and start at the beginning. So let's kind of wrap this up here. We all know that uh, losses are going to create two times greater of an emotional response. It just happens. If you want, go online and read more about the sunk cost fallacy. It's, it's phenomenal. It's such an interesting concept, or not concept, it's a theory, that we as human beings, this is how we react. This is what we do. And start to see some of the patterns you've done in your life where, oh, I stayed in that job too long because of this. I stayed in that relationship too long because of this. You're going to see that you're, you're doing damage to yourself by believing in this sunk cost fallacy. Uh, one of my favorite uh, podcasts, and I made my kids listen to this multiple times. Um, I'm a big fan of Freakonomics. If you've read the book Freakonomics, I highly recommend their podcasts. And my favorite podcast, sorry, it's not my favorite, but one of my favorites on there is called The Upside of Quitting. So if you want to listen to a podcast, it's about 30, 40 minutes, uh, the upside of quitting. And I made my kids listen to it. And it has come handy as they become adults. I reference, hey, remember the upside of quitting? Why are you still there? Why are you still in this relationship? Why are you still at this job? Why are you still doing this? And it gives us a really nice uh, area to talk because the upside of quitting is 100% about sunk cost fallacy. It's 100% about this theory. So jump into that. Uh, their other stuff is really good, but that's one I really love. And then it's just, look, you're going to do it. We all do this. It's guaranteed that we do this. So let's design some rules. How are we going to avoid this? All right. Thanks for joining me, everybody.